Right, good evening ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll, we'll make a start with just a few minutes behind time, but uh, uh, very nice to see you all here. I'm uh, Tim Parsmore and this is our uh, Chief Constable Douglas, um, Peter Ferry and Terry Byford, who will introduce themselves in a few minutes uh, when we get going. The format of this evening is just a couple of very quick presentations. The main purpose of the meeting is to hear from you to ask any questions you like about anything. We'll do our very best to answer them. Uh, if we can't answer them, we just need to take your details and get back to you. Um, so uh, nothing is uh, predetermined or predecided, so it's entirely up to you to ask whatever you like, whatever you like or even whatever you like. So uh, this, of course, is one of the meetings we have, seven meetings across the county, one for each district and borough. We had one a few weeks ago at East Bergholt, which was for the Baber district, and of course tonight we're in this rather nice town, Haver Hill, and this is the meeting for the borough of St Edmundsbury, and I think this is the sixth time I've been to a meeting in Haverhill in uh, just over a year, so I just wanted to say that, because Haverhill, like everywhere else, is just as important as the rest of Suffolk, just because it's down in the far corner doesn't mean it should be ignored, and I hope you will agree that is the last thing I would dream of doing, um, it's one of our most important, and of course, soon to be, perhaps our, maybe our third biggest town, who knows. So, um, I thought that was quite, um, quite appropriate that uh, in the role I've got, if we can all go forward together, this is not a question of um, me versus the constabulary or the other way around or versus the public. It's very, very genuinely meant as a comment that we are all here to try and help and support each other as we move forwards. Very quickly, the role of the PCC, hopefully most of you got a fair idea about it. I know it started off at a bit of a low ebb with that resounding turnout in the election 16 months ago. But these are the main points. Representing the public interest, budget of £125 million pound notes of yours and my money, trying to make sure we do what is best for us here in Suffolk. That's what I'm elected to do, look after the needs of Suffolk. Nowhere else, it's Suffolk that counts on this. Ensuring the policing needs are delivered, I don't interfere in the operational side, that's up to these good people, but I do have to try and make sure they've got the resources and capabilities to keep us safe and carry on with the very good work that has been done. We have a very good, low-cost force here, here in Suffolk, um, and I happen to think it's a lot better than many other places, but that's probably because I'm a bit, uh, bit biased. Um, setting the strategic direction, priorities, policing, budget and precept. And that's, the, that's an important part. The precept was frozen this year. Uh, just so you know, there's an underspend this year, uh, sorry, the year that's just finished, of just over £1.2 million, which represents 3% just over on your, three, uh, on your precept. So if you take the freeze grant of 1% from the government, Actually, we are quite all right for this current financial year, and in current predictions, we'll be, be all right next year. It's the year after that that we really need to work very, very hard about meeting the budget gap. Um, for all operational matters, this is why Douglas is here, uh, on your behalf, I hold him to account to make sure that your needs and requirements are met. Previously, it used to be the police authority. Now it's all down to one person. Now you can judge your own comments on that. What I would say um, is it's a quicker system I think it's much more open and transparent. I make my contact details and of the team freely available to anyone. So if you've got questions that you want to raise or concerns or ideas, of course, please let us know and we are definitely there to help. Um, very important, we continue with the very good partnership working that already exists and build on it. Organisations like Street Watch, Neighbourhood Watch, Farm Watch, huge amount the voluntary sector does. If you're looking at rehabilitation of offenders, we cannot do without the voluntary sector and the third sector. Really important we work together. Mental health, of course, is another big, big issue in our county and everywhere else. And then finally, um, in a brief resume, the police and crime plan is this sort of big document that the constabularies all over England and Wales have to deliver. It's a four-year document. And if you like, that's a customised plan for policing in our county as opposed to having what some people might have regarded previously as a one-size-fits-all for the whole of England and Wales. So in our plan, the strap line is making Suffolk a safer place to live, work, travel and invest. It reflects on the needs of the economy and it isn't just about farming or tourism. Of course, the small business sector is very, very important. Uh, looking at all sorts of other issues about crime prevention, support for victims and so on. So there hopefully will be something in there for most of the population, if not all of it, in Suffolk. As you would expect, some of the main objectives clearly responding to emergencies are absolutely vital. Solving crime, um, it's pleasing to see recorded crime is continuing to fall. 
and also the solve solving rate is going up. I think it now stands at about 34, 35% for the whole county. That has improved roughly 10% on a year ago. So the trends are in the right direction. And of course, prevention is always much more effective than cure. If we could get people to behave themselves better, when you're looking at antisocial behaviour, clearly we would all be very, very pleased about that. But there are other crimes and so on that we need to be um, aware of and so on as well. And of course, caring for victims, that's a big change coming up later this year, and vulnerable people. Now, vulnerable people, they could be young, they could be old, they could be from ethnic minorities, they could be disabled or whatever. And in a civilised society, of course, everybody has a right to be heard, they all have a voice, and it really is time those of us in a leadership position were able to demonstrate that that is how we behave uh, in a liberal democracy. Um, consulting with you, that again is a huge change at the top line there. In the first year we had over a thousand direct emails, letters of particular people with their particular concerns. Uh, the police authority in the last year only had 50 letters or emails. So this openness and transparency and engagement is really, really important. There's the website, we have monthly public surgeries, we had two today for example. And I'm a great believer, as is the team, on getting views on all sorts of things. Business crime survey there, speeding we launched at the Suffolk show last year, we had over 2,000 responses to that. Um, yes, I've got to mention the control room, which of course, as you now know, will be staying in Suffolk. Um, I thought the risk was too great. Uh, I'm not sure it was appropriate for Suffolk. We had over 1,700 people actually filled in our online survey. I've no idea what the East Anglian had and various petitions. And the reason I mention that, ladies and gentlemen, is very, very important that you, whatever you do, you try to bring the public along with you. And bearing in mind the opinions and feelings you, that people have, you have to be able to explain why you're making the decisions you are. I think it's a moot point that those that say along regardless, I'm not sure that's a terribly clever way um, to, to do things. Um, very important that we engage properly with business. Uh, I've got a very strong view that if the economy doesn't perform, we know if you get unemployment, you can tend to get a rise in the level of crime and social disorder and so on. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it is so important that we do a good job there. And of course, the reputation of Suffolk as a place to live and work in and invest in is enhanced by having a properly and well-performing constabulary. You've only got to look at other countries in the world or other parts of the country if that is not the case, it damages the reputation and that isn't acceptable. We've got to do everything we can, all of us, to try and improve that. And the last public survey, 92% of people felt safe uh, in Suffolk. And just a few um, actions in 2013-14. Um, Galileo, which was dealing with hair courses, 98% of people who think it's funny or clever to do hair coursing have got a previous criminal conviction. They're pretty unsavoury people. Um, one of my jobs is to help the constabulary be geared up to deal with people and the message to these guys is you want to come and mess with us in Suffolk Sunshine, we're going to sort that you out and make your life damned uncomfortable. And that's what it's about. Two new rural crime teams we've established in the last year that specialise in all of that work. Um, the economic crime unit is being expanded. There's a change coming along unfortunately, things like credit card fraud, cyber enabled, internet enabled crime which we need to be geared up for. Um, we are making progress with the A14, that of course is important to St Edmundsbury as a whole, as well as the rest of Suffolk. We've now got active engagement with the Highways Agency, but it is definitely work in progress. There are no magic solutions to that, but it is important we work on that. Uh, we do have additional specialist police officers, and of course, something for the youngsters, um, we are developing a county-wide police cadet scheme. Um, roughly 25-30% of those in a cadet scheme will come from a less advantaged background um, than, than some of us. And that's helping people uh, have more confidence going forward in life and being better citizens. Um, using the special constabulary, wonderful people, true volunteers, they get nothing for doing this. Um, but some of the capabilities they've got, be they in professional services or in the building trade or whatever, we can harness that again uh, to use their capabilities to make Suffolk a better place. Using um, academic research to look at all sorts of things, the two main uh, surveys being done at the moment, a county-wide um, assessment of domestic abuse. If the constabulary is going to try and deal with the problem, clearly it makes sense to identify and quantify the problem that exists in society before you come up with the solutions. Um, and I know Douglas and the team are very keen on evidence-based policing because that actually helps formulate the policies 
and the allocation of resources. Um, business crime is another survey. What are the crimes that concern business? So again, the policies can be formulated. And each month we have a theme for um, a priority. Um, last month it was cycling and motorcycling. This month it's uh, crime prevention. We've got one coming up later in the year on tourism and so on. Um, and then I think this is the last, last slide we've got. Um, the Community Safety Fund, £700,000. This is not my money, of course it's your money, taxpayers' money. That goes into a huge range of activities across Suffolk. And the reason that's important, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of it can be diversionary, supporting organisations like, for example, Neighbourhood Watch, but it actually gives some of the disadvantaged people a purpose in life, keeps them out of a life of crime, and I think that it's really important that we do what we can to deal with that. Um, community Speed Watch, of course, is a, a subject. Speeding comes up wherever we go. Um, funnily enough, coming over here, Sandra and I were in the car, and we passed Community Speed Watch at Horringer. Um, I'm happy to report I was very much on the speed limit. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't want to, can't have any adverse publicity like that. Um, so, um, but no, but that's a very good example of where people can work with the constabulary and help each other. Sadly, of course, um, Suffolk rape crisis is a necessary service that has to be provided. Um, drug testing on arrest, I have a loathing of the drugs culture. It's not me trying to be pious. But anything we can do to steer people away from that, get them cleaned up and so on, is really important because of the crime that tends to be associated with it. And the youth offending service, people perhaps who are arrested, they are trials if they've got a drug or addiction problem, then we can use a carrot and stick approach, which I'm very much in favour of, give people a second chance, but not a third, fourth, fifth, sixth <coughs> chance. We need to do what we can to sort that out. And then going ahead, I think this is the last part, um, we're going to have an in-depth review of the constabulary spend. There is a big spending challenge of 16 million over the next four years to deal with. I am quite confident, I'm not being blasé, that we can solve that, but we won't, well, we could do it all internally, but I do think we've got to look at joining things up across the public sector. We're all under pressure, and actually, if we can work more effectively together, surely that is the thing to do. Looking at blue light collaboration, working much better with mental health, the health business, loads of things we could do on that. We need to get on with it. Um, big change in October this year, Police and Crime Commissions are responsible for commissioning victim services. We've got to do more to look after victims. They could be individuals, but of course we mustn't forget they could also be businesses. And if they employ 10, 15, 100 people, some serious crime can have an adverse effect on a large number of people. So we've got to get the balance right for that and see what we can do. And I've mentioned the safer, uh, Community Safety Fund. £300,000 of that is going to be administered by the Suffolk Foundation. And the reason for that is... A, they'll be a lot more efficient than our, our own uh, team for doing that. Um, but they're also able to match some of the funding with other sources of money. So I think overall, Suffolk will benefit. The details are on the website. Really important that communities um, all over Suffolk feel able to apply for some support and help in whatever they're doing. Right, I'll ha quickly hand over to Douglas. And then we'll take questions when we've all done, done the talking. Thanks, Thanks Tim. It's very nice to be uh, back in Haverhill. I was uh, a young trainee detective down here in the early 90s, and uh, early 2000s I then moved to the Midlands, and they tell me it slightly dented my Suffolk accent, but uh, <laughs> af after a year back in force, I trust it's, it's coming back. I, um, I just wanted to touch on a few things at, at a force level. I'll be really quick, because I know you'll want to hear from Inspector Ferry about the things that matter uh, in St Edmunds Bay in particular uh, here in Haverhill for those who are local residents. I wanted to speak a bit about um, crime reduction. Um, first of all, uh, my own personal view is the, the focus that the constabulary has taken from the police and crime plan has made a big difference. Some things that in the past wouldn't have got the focus um, now are receiving quite determined efforts. And I think two examples would be um, rural crime. Um, I myself have been out to see some farmers, some landowners. They talk about having much more confidence now in policing, uh, the ability to work with police to bring down a level of vulnerability that they felt. Fuel theft has been a problem, theft of plants, theft of metal. They feel on top of the game now. And I think the other one is business crime. Sometimes the sheer volume was difficult for us to, to deal with, but working together with the business community driven by the police and crime plan, I think Tim and I get very, very different feedback from big uh, business, business forums that we now attend. 
So crime, crime is coming down uh, quite significantly. We were one of only 11 forces last year still reducing the levels of crime. A terrific result for our communities done in partnership. And Tim also talked about the number of resolutions coming up. Now, quite often that's somebody going to court, but I do give my officers full support in using what we call professional judgment. If they encounter a victim of crime, and it suits the circumstances, um, I do like to empower my officers to use their discretion. It's either uh, restorative justice, or sometimes we call it a community resolution. It's quick, shown to be highly effective, and generates a lot of confidence um, for victims. And out of that, we've um, shown satisfaction levels from the public um, higher than we've seen in recent years. 88% so of people satisfied or very satisfied with the service that they get from the constabulary. Uh, moving down, talk a little bit about the things that are emerging. So if um, house burglary, robbery, vehicle crime uh, is all coming down, what, what are the things that are starting to emerge for us? Very much around fraud, um, a lot of it happening on the internet. Some of it isn't reported to us as yet because the banks sort it out for people. Well, the banks are only going to put up with that for so long. And then I think the true scale of this will emerge. Identity theft, sometimes small amounts of money being scammed from people, but that's what criminals are now finding the easiest route, the easiest direction of travel. We need to scale up for that, we need to become more specialist, uh, and some of that we're now doing at a regional level. Um, do by all means, if you're on the internet, um, do have a look at the Fraud Action website, quite easy to find, just key in Fraud Action, Action Fraud, uh, and you'll find lots of help and advice to make you much safer as a user of the internet. Um, tackling vulnerability becoming increasingly important for us. About 25% of uh, the business we deal, deal with on the front line emanates from people with mental health difficulties. Sometimes they're victims, sometimes they're offenders, sometimes they're just exhibiting some distress in society. So mental health, alcohol, troubled families is a phrase that we use um, quite often generation after generation, the same families showing real signs of distress and difficulty but causing a lot of issues within their neighbourhood and also offender management. We can get much, much better at people who are not in prison, have either been in prison or they're at risk of going to prison um, by working with our partners to control those situations. I was also very proud of the constabulary. Um, recently, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary did a national uh, study of the response to domestic abuse Suffolk was one of, together with its partners, one of the top 10 forces in the, in the country for its response to domestic abuse and we know that quite often victims will suffer on 34 occasions before they ever get the confidence to ring the police on another agency. Our response has got to be top notch. I'm really pleased with that rating from HMIC. Quite a lot of what I talk to my staff about, however, is um, dealing with what happens to, uh, what matters to local communities. Sometimes they don't appear in the stats, it's just what local people talk about. Hopefully you'll talk about those things tonight when we give you a, a chance to speak. But people like uh, Inspector Ferry and his staff should be close enough to you to understand what matters, should then go on to deal with it, and should close the loop by telling you what has been done. That's public confidence in policing, when we manage to do um, all of those things. For our own part, um, Tim and I spend a lot of time available to communities. Uh, we've just embarked on, a, in addition to these evening meetings, um, occasions across the county when we're in marketplaces, town centres, shopping centres, we're there for four hours. People can come up and speak to us, uh, report lots of issues, uh, and as a result of that and the survey work that Tim's office did, we significantly changed the way in which we approach speeding within the county, no doubt we'll come to speak about that um, later on. Um, I think I think closing comment from me is, is about collaboration. We collaborate with lots of people, Fire and Rescue Service, um, the County Council, Immigration Service, Revenue and Customs, Norfolk Constabulary. Over the past few years working with Norfolk, we've saved collectively £24 million, some of which was an absolute saving, some of which we've reinvested in the front line. It's a means to an end. It just helps to keep Suffolk communities safe. We will do more of that into the future because it is a good way to keep services um, but reduce the cost and we'll try to keep you um, updated on that. One of the most exciting things I think we do, and this is about future planning, 
isn't so much about the back office collaboration, it's what we do with other services in Suffolk to bring down the amount of demand. In essence, bring down the amount of crime and disorder happening within our communities. So it's got to be quite brave work. It is about redesigning approaches. It's about releasing some money um, to do some different things. But if we've seen these big reductions in crime, we need to see more reductions in crime, potentially to cope with a shrinking workforce. But I'm really confident Suffolk is well set up to do that. Not least of which because of the work that's done locally on your behalf. So to get us closer to the questions, I'll hand over to Inspector Ferry, and then we can move on to the next part. I've been warned not to bamboozle you with figures, but some of what I need to talk about has to be about figures. You need to know if, if, if the crime is going up or going down, and the only way I can do that is by the figures. So I'll just read through these quickly, and then we'll move on to some of the, the meat, buck, meat on the bones. When I talk about Haverhill here, I'm also talking about the villages to the, to the north and the east of Haverhill as well, Clare, Keddington and those villages. I should just introduce my boss on the far right there, Superintendent Terry Byford. Uh, she's in charge of all of the west of Suffolk. I've obviously got Haverhill and um, 33, I think it is, villages that surround that as well. Total crime in Haverhill uh, last year was down by 274 offences. Now that's a 12% reduction, which I'm absolutely delighted at. I mean, that is a huge chunk less crimes and less victims in Haverhill last year. Anti-social behaviour in the Haverhill area, which also again includes uh, the rural areas, down by 492 incidents. And that's down by a massive 29% on, on our three-year average. I mean, that any inspector in the force or around the country would be happy with that, and I'm delighted at that. We also had the highest detection rate in the force last year for domestic burglary at 31%. Again, really impressive rate. And also serious sex offences standing at 58%, which was a massive, um, a massive amount more than some of the other areas in the force. So in terms of the pure figures, I'm really, really happy with what the officers at Haverhill have been doing. I recognise um, probably half the audience here from the regular SNT meetings that we have, uh, both at Haverhill and um, now up at Berry for the rural areas. Every three months we get together and we try and decide what are the main priorities for the public uh, in, our in our both of our areas. Haverhill SNT, we met in March. Um, we decided illegal drug taking in public places, specifically Castle Walk and the Rec. We had some members of the public turn up and they were really worried about um, what was happening in their area. So we took that on as a priority. That links in very well with number three on here, enforcement action against drug-related assaults on the Clements and Chalkston estates. And those of you that attended the last SNT meeting in March will know that we had a real issue back in March and February with um, some really serious assaults related to people who couldn't pay um, the drug debts that we had. Uh, Number two on here, parking issues at schools within the town. That is a perennial problem, probably in Haverhill and every other town around Suffolk. Uh, what I want to report to you, uh, because of the work that the SNT have done and linking in with our response officers at Haverhill and also with um, colleagues from other specialist units based mainly in Barry St Edmunds, since we took this on as a priority, we haven't had a single drug-related assault in Haverhill. I'm absolutely delighted at that. So I'm very grateful to the people that came to the SNT meeting and allowed us to focus on this. What we have done, we've managed to gather, putting the SNT officers into this um, priority, allowed us to gather an awful lot of new intelligence that's allowed us to carry out multiple warrants on addresses in Haverhill. We actually carried out two addresses today, uh, and I can report what we got. Um, four were arrested in those two warrants, between 15 and 20 wraps of Class A drugs were seized at one address and a load of Class B drugs were seized at another address, all bagged up and ready to sell. So by you allowing us to focus on that, uh, we've managed to do some really, really good work. We've cut down all the assaults that were related to, to some of the drug debts uh, and we just hopefully have an impact on number one here as well, the illegal drug taking. What I'd urge all of you here and all members of the public um, is just to report things to us. If you see drug taking taking place in a particular place, be it the Wreck, Castle Walk, or anywhere else in Hayville, please let us know straight away. It is a priority for us. We will deal with it straight away. We'll, we'll go out and we'll do our best to catch hold of those people immediately. For the St Edge Rural South SNT area, which is all the villages to the north 
uh, north of Haveyhill up to the border of Berry St Edmunds and also across to, to Cavendish the other way. The three priorities there decided in March, speeding motorists in Stradishill and Withersfield. And what we tend to do with those priorities is speeding always stays on the rural um, priorities. We just tend to move the villages about. So we give everyone a fair shake, really. Uh, and if any of you come from, from one of those rural villages, if you attend the meeting um, and say you wish us to, to do speeding in your village, it's almost certain that we'll have it as one of the priorities for that three month period. Also parking issues, again a perennial problem. The last three months we've concentrated on Wickenbrook Primary School during drop-offs and also Kennington on Friday evenings. You might wonder what's special about Friday evenings in Kennington. It's a fairly simple thing, they have a fish and chip van, turns up at a particular place in Kennington, people come from miles around and that causes problems for the villagers that live in that little bit. So um, it is a simple thing but it's, again it's a simple thing for us to focus on and to try and sort out. And lastly, uh, again really important to me, reducing burglaries in the area. If I was to tell you what my two main priorities are as the local policing commander for Haverhill, well they're both on there. Burglaries and drug taking, particularly class A drug taking. So I'm absolutely delighted to see the priorities that you, the members of the public, have actually picked out for us. I'm really grateful. And to move on to some of the things that I'm most happy about and some of the initiatives that we've set up in Haverhill. Uh, I'm delighted that, that John and Aaron are over here because they're, this first one here, they've managed to set up a, a particular website called haverhillvote.co.uk which allows us to live stream our SNT meetings. We've got our SNT chair Tim Marks out there, he, he allowed um, us to do this, I'm grateful to you as well Tim. And what this is about, for those of you that, that don't actually attend the meetings or haven't seen it online, uh, we're fully interactive with our meetings. Uh, we get between 40 and 45 people turn up to all of our SNT meetings, which is, I would guess, about the most anywhere in Suffolk. It's a very civic town and people want to come along, they want to say, to tell the police and, and other partners what their priorities should be. Um, but John, John and Aaron have allowed us to, to have a system where we film that. Um, that can be seen on any computer around the country instantly and it's fully interactive. People at home can vote on what they think the priorities should be. They can also submit priorities on the night to allow anyone that can't get to the meetings to have their say as well. So it's a way of bringing in um, members of the community that aren't particularly mobile or who are uh, at home looking after children. Uh, it gives them their say as well. And that's a system that I'm really proud of and I'm very grateful to the, the two chaps that sat over there for allowing that to happen. Um, they put their own time, their own money for the, for the equipment into it and it's just a civic thing that they do and I'm really grateful to them for that. Uh, one of the other initiatives that we've managed to, to pilot at Haverhill, we've appointed a domestic abuse officer and those who have been in Haverhill for a while will know PC Will Wright. Uh, I'm very open at saying he's the best officer at Haverhill, he is, and he's um, had an interest in domestic violence. And I've allowed him to um, became, become very well trained in um, dealing with domestic violence victims. We've also set up a um, domestic or a, a victim suite at Haverhill, which allows Will the time and the space to, to talk to domestic victims um, in private and in comfort as well. Um, rather than coming to quite a sterile area in the police station and for them to feel um, uneasy and unhappy, uh, the, domestic, the uh, victim suite is somewhere they can come sit very comfortably, have a cup of tea, relax and talk through. If it takes two or three hours, it takes two or three hours. It allows them to talk and to explain exactly what's been happening in comfort. And we've found that to be really, really important. Whereas before, um, they were worried about what they would get when they arrived at the police station. We're now getting victims turn up at the front counter of the police station asking to speak to Will and asking to go to the victim suite. So that has been working really well. It also allows our partners to come and use that victim suite at the police station as well. Um, there's a booking system and if any of our partners that deal with any victims uh, in Haverhill or the surrounding area want somewhere comfortable they can come and use, they come to the victim suite. So it's, it's not just being used by the police, it's being used by all our partners as well. And I'm really happy with that. The last one on here, I have talked about that before and somebody did laugh when I say we've, we've had a, a big revamp at the police station. Um, it, it's not funny to me because that means it's an investment in the police station in Haverhill. And if, if you were to walk around the police station today, you'd see it's all been freshly painted, it's been um, new facilities, a new kitchen, everything has been revamped. And it's, it's just a good feeling for the officers to know that the police station is there for the future. 
The town, as we all know, is going to get much, much bigger. We're potentially looking at 10,000, maybe more. And we needed a police station that was fit for purpose. We hadn't had any money spent on that police station for quite some time. Now, it is wonderful and it is just what we need. Should the town get bigger and should we need more officers here at Haverhill? Um, we've got the space and we've got all the facilities we might need there. I'm very proud of our, of our new police station and should any of you wish to come and have a look, come and ask me when I'm there and I'll be more than happy to, to give you a tour around the police station. Things that are coming in, because I always get asked about what's, what's the big thing that's coming in, um, we've seen quite a rise in shoplifting in Haverhill. Um, a massive reduction in car crime and quite a big increase in shoplifting. Uh, and it's quite, quite a strange thing. Why, why would that be? And the only explanation I've come up with is that people are now thinking that shoplifting is a relatively easy offence to get away with compared to um, breaking into someone's car and then having to sell um, the items that are in the car. I've had a, an operation running recently, um, specifically targeted at some of the regular shoplifters that we have in Haverhill. And what we don't get here is some of the professional teams coming in from outside, travelling in from the Midlands or the South. In general terms, when we get shoplifters in Haverhill, they're Haverhill people. Um, so that helps us to, to crack down on them. Um, it may well be at the next SNT meeting, uh, I might talk to you to see if you're interested in having shoplifting as a priority for us. Uh, but that will be, be for members of the public to decide. Um, but my, in general, my uh, view of Haverhill Police at the moment is, I think the figures are going really well. I'm really pleased with the officers I've got there. Um, really really proactive they punch well above their weight uh, and i'm generally happy and i hope you would be too thank you of course it's um your chance you can please ask any question um, you like we've got some microphones wandering well some of the microphones um, so if you just like to put your hand in the air and then ask away and we'll be um straight on to it I've lived all over the country and I'd like to uh, congratulate our local police force on their attitude, uh, which I find to be kind, considerate and very approachable. And this to me represents traditional policing, which is after all what we really like. I think that's a very, very kind remark. And um, can I say one of the first places I came to after the election was at Haverhill and I met Peter and I was immediately impressed with um, everything that's been done down, down here. And, Yes, and quite rightly, you've got a very good police force here. Um, it's super to see that. And I hope you all take that single investment in the police station. Of course, it's very important. And long may, long may it continue. So that's a real compliment for everybody. And obviously, very, very pleasing. Who'd like to go next? The gentleman in front first. Thank you. Uh, can I ask, please, uh, with a number of street lights turned off at midnight, do you think that this has had an impact on the apprehension of offenders and antisocial behaviour? It's an operational issue. This has come up in one or two other areas, actually. But you'll have to get that. The, the chief did say he'd be uh, looking at me some of the time. I didn't realise that had come so quick. Um, Having looked at the burglaries that we've had in Haverhill, perhaps over the last couple of years, an awful lot of those were daytime burglaries, so the lights being out wouldn't have had any impact. We did have a particular um, run of nighttime burglaries, creeper burglaries. Um, a chap called Alex Hockett was um, arrested and convicted of those creeper burglaries. He's now away for several years, I'm delighted to say. The main factor for those creeper burglaries was not the fact that the lights were out, it was the fact that people were leaving their windows and doors open. It happened during the summer, um, and he found it very easy to, to go to back doors and back windows, and, and he got. If we managed to get people to, to lock their windows and doors, he wouldn't have had a, a fraction of the success that he had. In terms of would we have caught him sooner if the lights had been on, um, I don't think we would have done. The way we eventually got him ha had no impact on whether the lights were on or not. We, uh, the short version, we waited close to his house, and when he came back, we grabbed hold of him and sure enough, he had some evidence on him that pointed to the burglary. So um, that was how we caught hold of him. In terms of ASB, our ASB rates in Haverhill, as, as we saw there, um, have come down substantially by, by quite a, a massive amount. Probably three or four years ago, we had a group in town called the Pinkies. I don't know if any of you would remember those. They were a, a group of 
um, the young teenagers who gathered together, silly name, but they were causing quite a nuisance. They were gathering together in parks in town and causing a, a massive amount of antisocial behaviour. They were broken by one of the previous inspectors here, but I, what I would say is we haven't got that um, large upsurge of youth-related antisocial behaviour. We have youths that gather on the market square, but I'm um, extremely happy for them to be there. That is the perfect place for them. It's very well lit, it's got CCTV coverage, it's 30 or 40 yards away from the police station, so we can be there in a couple of minutes if anything kicks off. But uh, in terms of antisocial behaviour caused by, by the lights being out, I can honestly say, Gordon, that um, that hasn't been a, a factor. Can I just quickly say that whatever you do, don't promote Inspector Ferry, so he leaves the area. He's, no, too, he's, worry, he's too good. He's too good for him. There's no chance of me getting promoted. I can promise you that. Thank you. I think there's a gen gentleman at the front here, and then we'll come to the gentleman at the back. Hello. Um, basically, I've lived in Haverhill nearly 20 years, and I can't feel any safer than we do at the moment with the team we've got in Haverhill, led by Inspector Ferry. I think he's been doing a fantastic job with the people he's got under him. But my question is, um, we need in Haverhill some sort of traffic warden to deal with real serious traffic issues because since we lost John, I can't remember his name now, John Wood, Woodgate, um, I feel that our police are just wasting their time. It keeps coming up at SNT meetings in every three months but nothing seems to change. We need some sort of deterrent, and I think that's the only way forward. And I think uh, yourselves need to put some pressure on Suffolk County Council or try and resolve this problem in Avail. Uh, just a quick comment before I ask um, Douglas. I think it's something we will have to take on together. I remember coming to a meeting here when I think it was County Council, the guy McGregor was there. Yes, you were there as well, weren't you, Tim? Where he tended to stir people up rather unnecessarily, I thought. It was a snowy evening, so I arrived late. And I could hear the howls of anguish before I even got in the hall. And I'm not saying that to be flippant. It is clearly a very serious issue. I think we do need to work together to find a solution. I will certainly take that forward. And I'm Douglas, I don't know. I mean, this has been going on for years, hasn't it? Yeah. We do need to do something, in fairness to the business and residents here. So. Anything you want to add to that, Douglas? Yeah, on this occasion, Peter is itching to, to give a response. But I, I, alluded, I alluded to the fact that um, when, when we do engage with the, uh, the public as commissioner and, and, and senior police officers, lots of people want to talk about driving standards. They want to talk about uh, parking. They want to talk about antisocial behavior associated with the use of vehicles. And we really have started to respond to that. We have left lots of enforcement powers with the police community support officers. They're not, they're not traffic wardens anymore, but they have got those enforcement powers. And I know, um, speaking with local officers today, that there's been a lot of enforcement work done. Now, that will take us so far. I think that some situations demand that we start to look at some road engineering solutions to these things. And I suspect in certain areas of Haverhill, we're at that point, and it does take us into discussions with, with partners. Peter will know, I think, the places you're talking about. Yeah, please do. We're going to lots of towns up and down the land. They have traffic enforcement officers. And in Hayfield, we've got nothing like that. People are just complacent. And yeah. They just do whatever they like. Park on the pavements. Park where they like. Park on the yellow lines. There's no deterrent. Okay. Whatsoever. Let, let, let me reassure you that police community support officers still have got um, en enforcement powers, so, that, so there won't be a case of turning a blind eye. But when something gets to a stage, it's signalling that it needs a bigger, a bigger solution. But let, let me bring Peter in, because I know you've got a specific point. My answer to this will be, be in several parts. Firstly, thank you for mentioning John Woodgate. He was um, a bit of a legend. He did give parking tickets to Police cars, milk floats. <laughs> I think he went too far when he gave one to a funeral hearse. <laughs> he did actually give a ticket to a funeral hearse parked outside the church. Um, that was probably a bit too much. It has been a priority at the SNT meetings, probably since I arrived and before. I remember Chris Galley, the, the previous inspector, was pulling his air out of parking in the high street. Um, certainly, I won't go back for two and a half years, but certainly for the last two periods of three months, um, 
six months to three months ago, we gave out 200, over 200 tickets. Um, three months to end in March, we gave out 400, over 400 tickets. So that's over 600 um, tickets in that six month period. Um, and I won't bore most of you, because you've heard me say this um, on numerous occasions, the police giving out, um, the tickets that we were able to give out had, had no impact at all um, on parking in the town because people have made the assessment that they would rather pay a parking ticket and park right outside the shop they want to shop in rather than park in the massive amount of free or very low cost car parks that we have very close to the high street. And so that, that, is a, that is a real problem. I'm certainly with the town council uh, and have been for quite some time in terms of what we think the solution is. We think the solution is a very simple barrier across the high street to stop all vehicles entering between 10 and 4, very similar to what we've got in Queen Street. We certainly don't have problems with parking in Queen Street between those times. We might have them after the barriers are removed. Um, SCC have looked at whether those barriers are possible. They've decided that those barriers are not possible, unfortunately. SCC have looked at other options, and I'll talk about two of those other options now. There was the one-way system that they intended to bring in. Um, I was consulted on that. Um, perhaps some other local residents were. And I was very happy with the one-way system as it's, as it's pro proposed. Uh, we've just heard, probably in the last week, that, that one-way system now, which would have in effect stopped vehicles reaching the high street from half of the town, that is now not going to go ahead. Um, I think certainly some of the councillors here were involved uh, in asking for wider consultation. When that wider consultation was done, um, many people, particularly those in the affected area, were not happy with the plan as proposed by SCC. Um, given their due, SCC have not um, rested on their laurels. They're now proposing, um, via Superintendent Byford and myself, that they are prepared to part fund uh, a PCSO specifically to work in the high street. Uh, and to deal with that parking issue. That would be what they would spend the vast majority of their time doing. And I think that has come, without naming too many names, that has come from uh, people that are in this room at the moment. Um, they're happy to part fund that. I need to work through with Superintendent Byford and with some other people at our headquarters whether that would be a suitable thing to do. My initial view would be, wouldn't that be absolutely perfect? You know, if that person is dedicated, as much as you were, af much as you were asking for, if that person was dedicated, and that was their job, to give out tickets to any vehicles in the high street that are committing offences. Yeah, and that's what they would do. They would walk out of the police station, 20 yards later they're in the high street, and then walk up and down, up and down, as, as far as I see the job. There would be other things involved as well, um, but the majority, as I see it as the local commander here, the majority of what they would do would be exactly what you're asking for, Chris. So that would be a, a good solution, I think. Not well, perfect, and I wish we could just barrier it off, but we can't, so. Why does Southern County Council get a group of it where, you know, why don't they fund it? They're not for a traffic That's exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, that's, that's what they're going to do. Yeah, they're going to they're fund half of it. I'm sure we'll be able to find the other half between us, actually. So we'll, as long as they're committed to do that, I think we can find a way through that for you. There was a gentleman there first, then we'll come back to the front. You'd have his hand up first. Good evening, Commissioner. On your screen, you mentioned that you're looking for the recruitment of additional police officers. Can you explain to me, then, a member of my family who has been a PCSO in Suffolk for three years, wanted to join the police but had to go to Essex because Suffolk weren't recruiting, had her interview, or their interview, um, was accepted, um, had uh, a medical, a physical, and measured through uniform, had a letter accepting on the Thursday, and on the Friday was given a telephone call to say that no recruitment would be taking place. Can you explain that to me, please? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hand that on to Douglas, but I don't get involved in the actual, actual recruitment, just so everybody's aware. That is obviously delegated to the Chief Constable. What was up there was what we've done over the last year, uh, getting 20 additional officers. So, Douglas, um, over to you. So, is this a recently? Has this happened recently? Yeah, uh, yes, this was a transfer from Essex back to Suffolk, but uh, uh, it was just cancelled on the. On the okay, yeah. We, um, we have put our foot on the ball 
in terms of, um, of recruitment. We are running currently over establishment and um, in many ways that's, that, that's a good thing to do because we're spending every penny that we've got but I can't keep doing that throughout the rest of the year. So people will have been told that we won't be taking people on for, for six months, um, but we are keeping the situation under review. That's the same for transferees as it is for some of the PCSOs who would otherwise have joined us as regular officers. And we'll review it after six months. If the financial situation allows it, then I would take fresh officers on. But for the time being, for six months, put on the ball, uh, and I'll allow, I'll allow the establishment to manage itself down to the point where I think I can recruit again. And that's just the realities of managing the service today. What we do commit to is the people that we have selected, um, we leave them in a select group. We wouldn't put them back through the promotion, through the selection process. We'll just go to them and say, we're ready now, and give them a start date. So I'm sorry that your, your uh, member of the family has been disappointed in that way, but we'll keep that under constant review. So is it purely financial? Yes, I, I, I've got a, a funded establishment. Um, the, the funding comes from a mix of local and national. I can't go overdrawn uh, and I have to keep within that funding envelope. So I'll just manage the establishment as I go along to make sure I've got roughly the right, the right number, but I need to keep projecting ahead to ensure I'm not going over establishment because I haven't got a bank account that allows me to go into overdraft. Okay. Can I just ask then yes, why it was so suddenly put upon, you know, these young people went through, um, you know, an interview, they went through their assessment for physical yes. uh, ability, yes. um, their GP medicals, all the, you know, interview yes. process, having to travel to that, and then to be suddenly pulled, you know, rubbed so quickly, and, you know, why have, why, yep. why were they put through that process? Be, because sometimes, decision made so yes, because sometimes the, um, the establishment can be a little bit unpredictable. So what's currently happening is that we've got some regional resources where we contribute officers to. They're changing the shape. They're returning officers to us, which we hadn't budgeted for. So co you're constantly looking at those things moving. And when we anticipate we're going to go so far over establishment, we have to then just time the next recruit or the transferee intakes. And I'm sorry, I know it feels rough uh, when people get letters like that, but all we ask them to do is bear with us, keep going with their lives as usual, and then we'll come back to them when the time is right. Thank you very okay. much. Um, I was there a gentleman at the front first? Yes, there was. A, there's two gentlemen here, then we'll come back there. I've got to try and keep it in order. There's two, two here first. Yep. Thank you. Hello there. Refer to... Sorry. Referring to what Inspector Ferry said about this uh, street, I was at the meeting a long, long while ago when I believe it was a Mr. McGregor, Tim was in the chair, and he was um, very ignorant as to what is going on in the street. Now, you said you're for the moving of the traffic around the town. The traffic around the town won't go down those roads. They're all pedestrian. They're all little village lanes, aren't they? Not roads. The people from Ipswich don't seem to appreciate that. Can you, as police, carry any power towards the council or whoever's in control? Was his name Mr. McGregor, who walked out of the meeting? Yeah. Well, have, have you got any weight that you can push? Our case, well, you, you know the case. You know what's needed. And like you said, I know a lot of people. They park there all the time. They don't care. How many? Oh, we don't care. We pay the fines. And it's not really a policeman's job to be a traffic warden, is it? You should be doing what you're doing, policing the proper crimes. I must be honest, and you'll have heard me say this several times, if, if I've got a choice between dealing with burglary dwellings and Class A drug crime mm. or parking tickets in the high street, it's a, it's a very easy way up for me. We do work um, very closely with SCC. and We've got um, some really good SCC councillors uh, in the town at the moment. Um, the, what SCC are trying to do, they've said what they can't do, what they are, what they have now gone on to do is to try and say what they propose to do to, to help with the issue. Their first bite of the cherry was the Mill Road um, one-way system. That's now gone, you know, public consultation has, has buried that. Their next um, uh, stab, at, stab at things is going to be part funding this PCSO. We'll see what happens with that. I'm, I'm confident um, if we get the right person in there, someone that's robust enough, 
and really wants to put that effort in, I'm confident that day after day after day, if somebody's getting a £30 ticket every day when they go shopping, there's going to be a point, surely, unless they've got fortunes in their pocket where they say enough is enough. You know, I've spoken to people who've had three, they think that's nearly enough. You know, if they've had five or six, surely, they can't you afford already, to keep doing that. You've already said the figures have gone up tremendously, but they're still doing it. Yeah, they, they, they are. They are. And where you're thinking 200 and that's 500, they're still doing it. Actually any effect, is it? Yeah, I mean, my my solution to it <laughs> is to get SCC to agree to, to put that barrier up, which is what the town council have been saying for donkeys' ages. Yeah, but to do but, that, but, you but they won't. You need the infrastructure for the roads to get the traffic around. Mill Lane and Quakesway—they're not roads. They think they are eventually, they're not. They're just little tracks. Yeah. Can you put any weight on your departments? On yeah, I, I can certainly help. Got a regular meeting. Graham Newman's a new portfolio holder. I've got one coming up. I will take it up on your behalf. I'll talk to Peter beforehand, and we'll try and put this all together. And I will then we'll let you know what's happening. I'll let the town council know. So if we get that, Vanessa, better get, better get, better get that noted down, or I'll get into trouble next time I come back here. Uh, I think there's another, there's another gentleman. Then we'll come come down to the back. So, um, <coughs> okay. Has the police, um, the, the county, changed its strategy with the helicopter? It used to be a, a regular um, visitor over the town, and we haven't seen it for quite a while, or maybe I haven't seen it, but just wondered. Right. Um, I'll, I'll ask Douglas to comment on this in a minute. Um, this is something that was inherited way before I was elected, way before Douglas was here. The new National Air Police Service was um, more or less mandated, you all jolly well pay for it. Suffolk had an absolutely lousy deal over this. It's spending hundreds of thousands of your money for a service that, that we haven't used. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to the Chief Financial Officer, funny enough, about it this morning, and um, he's sending some information through. We're gonna write a really strong letter, not only to the Home Office, but also to one of the other commissioners who helps oversee the air traffic um, or the, the helicopter service, because I think it would be fair for me to say we're happy to pay for the hours that we want but completely unhappy and not prepared to pay, and if necessary, unless I'm legally bound not to, I'll jolly well withhold the budget for the bit we don't want, because we're not in a position to start spending three or four hundred thousand pounds on something we don't want. Bearing in mind what the lady and gentlemen say there about PCSOs and so on, that money would be put to far better use, um, talking locally. So we will certainly be very, very robust on that, I can assure you, because it's not acceptable and it needs sorting out fast. So, so the situation is, is, is uh, to make it clear, is it grounded at the moment or? Oh no, no, no. no. It was one of those things where it was judged at a national level that we'd make far better use of these quite expensive assets if they all went into a collaborated pot and um, they were deployed from a, from a central point. It's actually now West Yorkshire Police that, that owns the whole national structure. Uh, and what they're looking to do is to uh, chop in some helicopters for some fixed wing aircraft, which offer a slightly different capability for us. The reality is when Suffolk had its own helicopter and it was paid for outright, um, we used to put it up all the time because we had it. <laughs> Lost kitten, send the helicopter up. Uh, now, now we've actually got to negotiate to get, to get a, a, an aircraft it's, it's not flying nearly as much, and hence we've got this odd situation. We used to use it all the time, uh, and now we've realized probably we don't, we don't need it for a lost kid. I exaggerate. It's still a fantastic um, asset for um, lost, lost people. Um, it, it can be a terrific asset for major, major operations like firearms operations or big public order situations. So I'd always want to have that firearms cover, but, uh, or that aircraft cover, but, but you will see it less now than you've seen it in the in the past but i think we're getting closer to a much more proportionate use of the of the helicopter i hope you never see the fixed wing aircraft because that would defeat the point <laughs> is, that, is that okay so things have changed quite significantly is, is the answer yeah uh, it's just that i hadn't seen an announcement on it that was all um, it's, it's still around much. still based at Washington. Yeah. thanks very much yeah. okay now we have some questions at the back there we are yeah, and then we'll come um, this is for Douglas and Tim, really. It's about training. Um, I am chair of the Haverhill Autism Support Group. Um, there's one in 80, well, 100, and it's coming down to 180 that's been diagnosed with autism. Um, when 
uh, a person diagnosed or undiagnosed, especially the older ones, um, when they're undiagnosed, and they end up in prison, a lot of them. Um, it's apprehending them. When you apprehend someone with Asperger's or autism, uh, they can get really violent because they don't like being apprehended. And I'm just wondering if there's any training in autism among police officers. Okay, I'll, I'll hand that on to Douglas in, in, in half a minute. But I think that's a very, very important issue. This concern about mental health, I mentioned it earlier. We haven't got the balance right collectively, society as a whole on this. Um, and that is an ongoing piece of work. Funnily enough, I had a meeting with the top guy from the Mental Health Trust um, this afternoon, so we've agreed to meet again, having had discussions, I haven't managed to catch up with Douglas on this yet, we haven't seen each other, but finding a way forward, there's already some good work being done to relate, isn't there, Douglas with them, two mental health practitioners working with the constabulary, so it is operational, but clearly I, I also have, have an interest, so Douglas, um, over to you. Do you know, I, I'm sure if you're passionate about the subject, and, and we all should be, I think you'll say we're, we're still not doing enough, and I'd probably put my hands up and say that's, that's true. We... Um, we provide some awareness to, to all of our staff. We have um, just devised a single day when we are trying to give all of our frontline staff a general understanding of a whole range of conditions so that they can recognize that something is different and they can then start to tailor their response accordingly. And if they recognize that something, something is different, sometimes they can, the, the officers, the PCSOs can amend their behavior and then it doesn't trigger a reaction from the person that they are dealing with. Lots of the detailed training and awareness goes for our custody staff because sometimes when people are in custody, the responses are, are most acute. T Tim alludes to, I think, one of the, the most positive developments we've had uh, recently, which is to, with the Mental Health Trust, make two community psychiatric nurses available to our patrolling staff. They're actually out and about with our patrols um, we can deploy them around the county, but clearly to get to here it would take some time, but we don't, we don't rule that out. They're mainly based around, around Ipswich. If that works well in getting a much more tailored service who, to people who need it, then I think we'd be prepared to talk about expanding that service quite significantly. Because there's no point continuing to put people through a cycle of criminal justice when that's not what they need. The issue about um, people triggering violent behaviour. I think officers are much more switched on to than they ever have been in, in the past. The equipment they've got is now better uh, and there's certainly more awareness than there has been before, but it's not perfect by any means. So I'm so happy to take further comments if you think there's more we can do. Yeah, um, just um, for instance, the training side of it. Um, most people with um, autism like Asperger's don't give direct eye contact. Some do, some don't. It's like everyone, we're all different. Um, but them sort of things is where the training can come in to the officers and they can recognise it. Um, it. It's just them s small little things. Um, and if, they, if you start putting your hands near them then, or grab them, then they become extremely violent. And, and that's, especially, you know, especially me the men, the men side of it. The, the girls, not so much, but the females, not so much, but the men really become violent. So. That's the sort of thing that, you know, this training is, is really, really essential. Thank you. I, I think you'd be quite encouraged that, that, that the one day course across, across a whole range of issues, you know, up to and including uh, dementia, we do a lot of, a lot of work on, on dementia now. Many of us are dementia friends. I th I, as I say, I think you'd be quite encouraged at the basics that, that the officers get. And just to follow on from that, um, we've got a Concord Act that we are signing the constabulary other um, agencies, um, I can't remember the exact date, I think it's in about 10 days, two weeks time, um, where we're all pledging to work together, exchange these ideas about training, join things up in a lot better, a lot uh, more effective way. Um, Douglas and I went on a course about dementia friends. So again, there's a community involvement, obviously those in the front line need to work more closely together. So it is an ongoing piece of work, but I think you raise an extremely important issue that we need to deal with, and we are, it's work in progress. The gentleman there. I wonder if the, the Chief Constable could use his influence. We, we who live close to the prison, we, we would like to, to meet some of the people in the prison. They don't get out now like they used to, but even so, it would still be quite nice to know what goes on there. Thank you. I'm sure that could be set up. I went round um, High Point Prison um, 
two or three months ago. So, yeah, we can take, take that forward. Yeah, yeah we, we certainly can. Um, Tim, Tim and I serve on uh, a criminal justice board that, that, that provides improvements in, in justice service across Suffolk and Norfolk. And the, um, the governor from, from High Point is the prison representative on that body. So, so Tim and I quite often, both of us have been down to, to the prison. I think they're looking for uh, community engagement, not so sure I'm keen on people getting out, <laughs> but, but they are keen on, on community engagement. They're very positive about the work that they do. Prison service going through lots and lots of changes. Uh, if, if you leave your details at the end, we'll pass that on to the, pass that on to the government. Just on the uh, prison side, uh, when we went to High Point, um, we are looking at a, um, a programme of work we can do for those prisoners there who actually come back to Suffolk. The vast majority, you're probably aware, come from London, but for that small minority of those who are detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, not just at High Point but also at Hoseley, we are looking to get some reintegration work because again that will be reduction of crime prevention, diversion schemes, getting them in perhaps to employment, part-time work and so on so they can stand on their own two feet. But it's a very, another very important issue. The gentleman next to you. We'll yeah, uh, we're here, we're about a mile from the Essex border, about two miles from the uh, Cambridgeshire border. Uh, I'd just like to ask about operational um, procedures between the two. I'm thinking about a road traffic accident, which I witnessed, where it took about an hour to get a, a, a Suffolk policeman there, and the driver absconded. Since we're so close, apparently there's very little cooperation on an operational level between the forces. I've never seen a uh, an Essex car here, I've never said a Cambridgeshire car here. I mean, what is the policy on this? Uh, that's definitely <coughs> operational. <laughs> we, are, we are, as you say, right in a, in a triangle down here. We're right on the border of Cams and Essex. Um, the local police and commanders for the, the various towns around have, have regular meetings. We share a lot of intelligence about cross-border criminals. Um, the particular incidents that, that you said there was that over the border into one of those other counties, or was right, it right, in right. A mile, Literally a mile from Cambridgeshire, a mile, sorry, a mile and a half from Essex. So, and it's the same. Apparently you never call these guys, you never call them, uh, somebody in from the other counties operationally, it never happens. What, was so, it in, sorry, was, was the accident in Suffolk, or was it? Was it in Suffolk. Okay. But you didn't have an officer there for the best part of an hour, and the driver absconded. I'm surprised at that because we, we should have officers either here in Haverhill who would have gone very quickly or... You were very busy. You had a PCSO on the scene who could only direct traffic and in the meantime the driver who had been drinking decamped and you couldn't find him. By the time you turned up, one guy turned up, you were busy that afternoon. Yeah, I'm surprised at that. We, we should and could have sent officers either from Sudbury, from Newmarket or from Bury St Edmunds. The guy came from Bury in the end. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's half an hour hard But who would call in? Why would somebody actually, in a situation like that, would anybody call the Cambridge Control or the Essex Control and ask for backup? We work very closely. Only just this weekend, I was the duty inspector just this weekend, we had um, a mental health issue from a lady in Haverhill. She got in her car and drove into Cambridgeshire. We cooperated with Cambridgeshire um, and we managed to, to get hold of that lady and take her to a place of safety. So. We do have day-to-day -day cooperation with Cambridgeshire. But you I wouldn't see. call a Cambridgeshire officer in here if you were very short, or an Essex officer in here if you were uh, very it short. It does happen on very specific occasions, particularly with the World Cup coming up. Um, we will cooperate very closely with ne nearby forces. Certainly we have gone into Essex to help them with, with violent incidents. Essex have come into Haverhill Town Centre as well in, in the, the past year to help us with issues as well. So it does happen, but it has to be something relatively serious for the, for the control room inspector in those other counties to send officers here. We wouldn't at this point, we're not particularly linked up with CAMS and with um, Essex uh, in the same way that we are with Norfolk. We have a collaboration with Norfolk and we control officers from, from our control room, from the Norfolk control room, particularly for officers like traffic and firearms, so we can move them totally borderless. We're not linked up in the same way with CAMS and with Essex. Wouldn't it be a bad idea, Tim, to maybe look at that, can, since can we're I, so close here? Yeah, well, again, it's operational. Yeah, yeah short sure, yes. um, Well, I, actually, I, I, I think a bit of support from the commissioners would be helpful. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, colleagues in uh, Simon Parr in Cambridge, Stephen Kavanagh in Essex might be a little bit embarrassed tonight. So I think I would be if, if, if I had resources available, somebody was in need over the border in Cambridgeshire, and I didn't have the chance to send an officer to support the public. So, so this is a conversation I'll have with, uh, with my colleagues in, in the other two forces. And I think if the chiefs and the commissioners could agree that it, it could be nearest unit attends when it's, a, when it's an issue of safety, 
that, that's bound to be to the benefit of the public. You know, sorting out the paperwork later on is clearly something we'll do in accordance with local procedures. But getting an officer there to protect the public has got to be yeah. the most important thing. <coughs> so I think it's yeah, well, yeah, fantastic yeah. you've raised it. Yeah, and there we go, we've got support from the commissioner. Yeah. So, uh, do you, so would you pay for that? Would Suffolk no, no, pay? No, no, we wouldn't, wouldn't pay for that at all. Okay. No, because it would be, what, half, half, half an hour's work, they just hold the situation until such time as we we do the same for them. Yeah. It would be swings and roundabouts. Okay. And a bit embarrassed it's not happening already. Well, quite, because since we're so close. But, but that is, I think that is for chiefs and commissioners yeah, to give that so. our, our blessing. You know, local colleagues are doing everything they possibly can. We need to support them with that sort of direction. I would just like to add to the chief's comments that we do go just over the border, particularly with domestics. Essex have asked for our help with um, domestic incidents from villages that are three or four miles, two or three miles over the border. And we will always go to those, particularly when somebody's safety is at risk. Um, we'll go, and as the Chief says, we'll go and deal initially. We'll probably lay hands on the offender and we'll then wait for our colleagues from Essex to arrive. Um, so it's not as if there's a very, very strict border that we will never cross over. RTCs as well. That's. I am disappointed to hear what you say because RTCs, particularly on that main road to Cambridge, we are very often the first ones to arrive and we sort the issues out later. Um, okay, well, I hope that was reassuring. Good. Thank you. Uh, two gentlemen there. Tracy, thank you. Good evening. Um, on back, back to traffic again. Um, the, the village that I live in is in the process of buying to a vehicle activated um, signs for speeding. Yep. Um, now, I'd like your view on, on how effective these are, because the, the village is on a main road, the A143, and is very, very busy. Um, comparing those type of signs with, say, the average speed signs, which I believe would probably be more effective. I know they're more expensive. Um, can I have your views on what you think about the, the, comparing the two types of signs? Mm. Um, again, the colleagues here will have a view. Well, well, obviously, obviously a police point of view. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. looking at those, which ones do you think are better? <coughs> Under the extra specific speed or the... Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and the most frequent ones that people will see that's not to do with enforcement is the sign that flashes up, presenting the speed of the oncoming vehicle. For a period of time, for certain drivers, that has been shown to be effective. It will trigger their conscience and it will moderate their speed. And it will have, for a period of time, um, a positive effect. You can't rely on it for a long period of time. You've either got to move to enforcement or you've got to move to road engineering. Can I say another thing that's highly effective if you're not doing it in your area is community speed watch, which I think Tim mentioned during his presentation. That's where uh, members of the community come together, they get trained up by officers, they are issued with speed detection equipment, they detect a speeding vehicle, they take its registration, that's then passed on to the police and we send out advisory warning notices. It can be a really good way to get the community involved doesn't lead to the direct prosecution of that individual driver, but if that doesn't moderate it, we then get involved in an enforcement uh, mode, and then of course we can start to send people onto diversion courses, which are very, very effective. It's probably one of the most effective tactics that we've got available. So we can escalate it, absolutely um, use, use those devices, but do think about Community Speed Watch if you haven't already done so. Derry, Peter, anything? Certainly Community Speed Watch is popular in this area. I drove through the village of Coolidge this, this afternoon on the way back from a, from a course uh, and they will work in there as well. So it, it's something that we are using in this particular area. Uh, to talk about the, the flashing signs, we've had one uh, on the entrance into Haverhill for the past few weeks. And it has been very effective. Having been sat in a queue of traffic behind that, you can see that people know it's there and even though they're not going to get prosecuted for the speed that flashes up, they know that the, their speed is going to be displayed to members of the public so they slow right down. I did see this morning that it's disappeared. I don't quite know what's happened to it. <laughs> I hope, hope it's been removed by the council and not stolen. Uh, but that has been very, very effective. Certainly Great Barton, I would imagine it would do much the same as it did on the entrance to Haverhill. Well, the, the way we're going to do it is to move, the, to move it every so often to several different posts around the village and then move them. So 
when people get used to it being in one place, then uh, it will be moved to another one. I hope our camera's been moved to another site. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, well, what about the average speed cameras? Because you can't get away from them, can you? you, you know. And there, um, I can't work out with this zone or not. Uh, there are an enforcement tactic, and judged to be um, more moderating than a fixed point of, of speed detection because you're, you're clearly observing people's behaviour, driving behaviour over a much longer period, but, but it's an enforcement tactic. <coughs> One thing that you can help, we mentioned earlier as a result of the speeding survey, the deployment of the camera vans has been changed. If you have a particular village where you think you've got a problem, you can either let um, Peter or the SNT team know and we can arrange for a session there, or if not, you can write direct to us and we can also do that. And the whole point of this change was to make it less predictable, we'll go where the public wanted it to be, rather than, for example, being on the A14 trying to get people doing 78 or 79. I'm not saying that's acceptable, but there was more of a concern in places such as villages, market towns, residential areas. All of these things you need to have public support for what you're doing. Um, and I think it's important that the balance has changed and that is actually very helpful in the way it's been done. I get far less letters complaining about speed camper vans now than I did a year ago. And I think that's indicative of the way we listened to what the public said with our survey. We've worked together, changed the pattern. I'm not saying it's perfect, but actually it is being more effective, I think, with this sort of deployment. Because there are areas where it's downright dangerous and you do get some idiots driving there. And there is no excuse for that. It's very easy to sit here and say that. Why very, very quickly. Why do you come to the side where you then put the camera? It's on a website and the local radio. It's, it's in this area. Why, because, why do you do that? Well, because we are trying to do it in an open and transparent way. And not everybody hears that. It is just to make sure you can't be fair in that. And that, on balance, I think is a reasonable thing to do. It's not there to try and trick people. What it is there is to change their behaviour. <coughs> and it really is. We, it, and interesting, the number of um, offences, there's a big report, and I think it was East Anglia today, shows the use of the fixed cameras and other things. And we are trying to get the balance right. And I'll just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, one thing. The money from the speed awareness courses, um, I think, costs about £50 to arrange it. And the penalty is, I think, about £80 or so. That remaining money goes into the safety camera partnership and that is now ring fence for actually helping to improve driving standards, looking at young youngsters driving with advanced tests and supporting things like community speed watch. It doesn't go into support anything else, it is there kept purely within Suffolk to do what we can to invest in speed awareness and um, making the roads safer. So that, that's another change that has, has not come in. Um, we're gonna come, there was a gentleman there and then I'll just I'll come back over there to Tim. And then I'll come back to other people and we'll be here again. So, okay. Hello. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a couple of questions. Um, I'm not sure if I'll get an answer there, but that's certainly fine. Um, is that, um, in my experience, it, it seems as though, in terms of, um, and it's interesting that the gentleman already raised a question about, um, I still call them RTAs, but obviously you call them RTCs now. But a, a good old yeah, road traffic accident uh, in my days. Um, is that um, it, it appears to me that um, in, in I can only speak from my experience is that um, it, I just wanted to ask if this is Suffolk Police's policy um, that um, it, that the uh, offending drivers seem to be personally contacted um, um, by the police to get information and a statement of events from their perspective um, yet any kind of victims of these uh, crimes or accidents um, are kind of left hanging uh, basically um, and I don't know whether this is um, anything to do with um, the uh, TJU's um, whether it's appropriately staffed with senior officers. I know there's a, a senior officer that has to cover three different locations, um, which s does seem to be kind of stretching things a, a little bit. Um, and um, also whether Suffolk Police have instigated the required training uh, to its frontline staff or control room staff in terms of reporting uh, an RTA that involves injury because unfortunately I had um, four different responses from the police um, before the kind of um, 
the correct solution was kind of a um, given to me, if you like. Um, and I'm sure there's some of these questions that you can't answer and you know uh, might want to reference some of that absolutely fine um, and um, it's um, and I, I feel for the gentleman that gave the question about the having to wait for a, a driver uh, a, sorry wait for the police to attend uh, I mean I, I did the opposite and actually chased the driver that left the scene and, and got their details etc but that to my experience is not sufficient either so um, it, it's just a kind of very um, disillusioning uh, experience uh, unfortunately um, okay. probably too many questions there I guess yeah certainly if you want to give us some details afterwards we, we can look into it you've got any general comments on that Douglas you know th th this can be a very emotive issue for people it's you know sometimes the, the biggest event that they'll have in their driving life sometimes it's the biggest event people will have in their in their lives and we try to offer the most scrupulous fair and, and attentive service some some of it is remote because we're running these services out of single locations within the county but we do try to offer everybody the opportunity to record their experiences give us the evidence they've got and then we've got dedicated decision makers who do nothing other than um, try to arrive at very fair decisions over diversion no further action or prosecution. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that your experiences haven't given you uh, the confidence or, a, or indeed a resolution. Maybe something we can pick up on um, out after after the meeting. I'm very happy to uh, happy to do it, that. I mean, to 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 be honest, I mean, you know, um, it's down to the police to obviously to investigate something, yes. and they can only do that on the on the information or evidence that they're provided with. That's true. Um, I'm saying that if if the if I'm not asked for that information, then it's very difficult for anyone to come to any conclusion apart from no further action because nothing else has been requested. Um, so it, it, it's the, there is kind of sort of frustrations um, in the kind of um, from from my perspective in terms of. Um, been at least given the opportunity to provide that information and be informed yes. that I need to do that. You know, if, if I, you know, I mean, when I went back to the scene of the accident yesterday um, to take photographs myself, yes. um, I was stopped by an off-duty officer asking me what I was doing. Yes. And I politely said, probably your job. But, uh, you know, uh, he was from Suffolk, uh, from uh, Saffron Walden in Essex, right. so politely said, Good luck and bye bye. So that was okay, oh, okay. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it is a kind of um, emotive thing. I think uh, purely because I think um, I'm sitting here and I'm okayish, yes. you know. And I think purely because I think of my mum that was 74 in the car and three-year-old nephew, and I think we're bloody lucky, you know. Okay. And yet, you know, you just um, it's difficult when you don't kind of feel like no anyone's listening right you know, okay. as polite as you can be about it okay. I'll, I'll shut up on that no, no, I, 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 we're, we're, I've it, got I've got the issue one of us will be available for you after meeting I think for the for the broader audience um, what you can expect is an impartial attentive service albeit sometimes we'll be writing to you to say can you complete your own account of your experiences there won't always be an officer who comes to personally handwrite the, the statement but people shouldn't be left feeling that they've been ignored at the end of it, whether you might be the driver who's blameworthy or whether you're the outright innocent party in it, you should still get your opportunity to contribute your experiences. And I would hope that's what people, if they're unfortunate enough to be in that situation, experience. But let, let's take your situation on after the meeting. I've just got one other point about the traffic situation in Haverhill. Uh, I've lived here for 40 years and this has gone up, down and all the rest of it. And as much as I... Uh, don't have any problem kind of well I do have a pe problem with people parking well I, I I wouldn't give my support to an officer in any description being part funded or totally funded to stop people prevent people or giving tickets in the high street because I, I, I honestly agree with Inspector Ferris that that is if I was sitting in his job, I think that is a waste of resources. As much as of annoyance it is with people parking there, what I can't understand 
and maybe it's a budgetary thing. Why, uh, you know, an ARP and our camera can't sit, or you know, I've been to Nottingham and other city centres where they've got warnings that we've got a camera here. It's going to record your number plate. If it's if you're not allowed to go up here where you haven't registered your disability badge here, you're going to get a ticket through the post. And at some point, like rather than the PSOs always having to go out there every day, someone getting a ticket every day for abusing it, they're going to get to the thing, well, I've had enough now. And it's, then it's, it's a fixed cost initially, but it's not taking up any further resources. I can't understand why that option isn't, maybe it is on the table, I don't know, but, you know. We'll find out for you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. If I could just say very quickly, um, I am aware of the individual accident that you mentioned. Our professional standards department are already looking at that matter to see if you received the standard of care that you should have done. The officer in Haverhill that you spoke to, he's had to provide a, an account to professional standards, so they'll look to see what he told you, whether it was whether it's correct or not. I know it was bounced to you. It was. Okay. Thank you very much. Tim had a question. Yeah. Um, well, not a question, observation really. Um, the static speed recording or the speed activated signs uh, are largely ineffective in my experience in Haverhill. We have two on the approach road from Cambridge into Haverhill and I can see one of them from my house and it's more often saying slow down, slow down than it is actually working and they're triggered at around 36 miles an hour I believe, not 30, so the traffic's already moving pretty quick. Uh, whereas the speed indicator devices, um, they tell you your actual speed and they flash green if you're in within the limit and red if you're over the top and then there's always a suspicion what's around the corner well, as you see now what am I going to run into next and I think people do take much more notice of that the other thing I'd like to comment about is uh, people getting out of prison um, indeed work parties do come from the high point and they, they come to this town uh, and they help us at Habel in Bloom in, in maintaining uh, some of the things that which we provide for the beautification of the town. Thank you. Yeah, just it was very interesting when I went there, the prison workshop they've got there, the amount of work they do, there's a huge range of different activities. I, I was really rather impressed with that, so that's a very good point. So, we're, we're back to, still back with traffic, but um, we seem to be, because we're on the edge, and it seems that traffic officers get as far as Horringer and then they sort of lose all sense of direction. Um, given the, the, the size of the town, um, we have fast roads in and out, we've got the bypass, I'd like to see some traffic cars here. And on top of that, we've got huge amounts of lorry traffic coming in and out. Um, so perhaps we could also have Vosa as well every now and again. Yes, take that forward. Take that, yeah, they will be written down and we'll, we'll come back to you on that. Anybody else got a question? <coughs> yes, nobody who hasn't had one before, then we'll come to the two gents at the front. Round two. Uh. Thank, you. thank you. Uh, <laughs> just touching on what somebody said about vulnerable people, uh, I'm presuming, might be wrong, but do the officers in Havel regularly attend sort of child protection, uh, safeguarding children workshops? Uh, not, um, it, it's not it's not a scheme that we seek to have every single officer um, trained in. What, what they have got is a system of easily referring concerns into um, child protection or indeed adult protection arrangements that run extremely well with our partners across the county. So all they've got to do is spot somebody that might need some help, quick referral, and then the help is in. It's too specialist to try and give everybody that sort of, that sort of knowledge. But they know where to turn to, if that helps. Okay, so. Hello. Um, <coughs> With the recent uh, revelation that some forces um, crime clear-up rates, um, the statistics, weren't all as um, they seem, um, how robust are our counties? Um, that's a very pertinent question. I actually raise this every other month um, at the Accountability and Performance Panel where uh, Douglas and his colleagues are um, asked some fairly vigorous questions from ourselves as a team. Uh, this has come up twice um, since, since, um, well, since we were both appointed, actually. Um, all I can do is tell you that I can assure you we have an independent crime registrar who dips samples, in other words, takes certain categories of data to look at to make sure that it is all exactly where it should be. I have seen no evidence to suggest that in Suffolk the recording is not of a very high standard. 
I do ask that regularly. I also sit on a national um, inspectorate um, committee that just spends its whole time looking at data. It is an issue elsewhere, but I can certainly assure you from what I've seen, there's absolutely nothing to be worried about here in Suffolk. If there were, I would tell you, we would be having vigorous conversations. And it's certainly something that the public, quite rightly, would expect me to raise on their behalf. So it's an ongoing thing, and we do everything possible, I think it's entirely fair to say that, to record things. If anything, people say that Suffolk can, perhaps goes a bit over the top sometimes and records absolutely everything. So we're, we're definitely on the case, but that's a very useful question. Anyone else before we um, draw it to a close? Right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for coming in all your questions. Just before you go, on some of the, um, this is really just for information, there are one or two flyers there about Positive Futures who are a group that we support that does a lot of work with youngsters, particularly disadvantaged youngsters, and they have got um, the Haverhill Teenage Pre Kicks Project, um, a very worthwhile organisation to support. So if you hear about it from a town council or other community <coughs> leaders, or indeed just as parents or grandparents and something, encouraging people to join those things, um, I think is, is very, very helpful indeed. So, um, thank you very much indeed for coming. If you want a business card so you can ring me up and harangue me personally at any time, you're very welcome to have one. Um, the team are certainly here to help. Um, we've got a very, very good team in the Office of Police and Crime Commissioner who are there to support and help uh, everything that we do and the work. And of course, I do want to thank once again for the team up here on my right for coming along with Douglas, Peter and Terry. Um, my view is that you do get, do get served very well in uh, Haverhill. Um, fantastic job that they're doing here. And of course, thank you to our um, team over here with the live streaming. That's a first, certainly, for us. And um, so thank you very much indeed, everybody. And um, safe journey home.